um, so praise the Lord. I finally, after doing months of topical sermons, which is really not my uh, comfort zone by any means, I'm much more of an exegetical sermon kind of guy. I, I like to be like to follow where the Bible uh, takes me. But the Lord uh, just had nothing, just it was clear I was to stay in the topical stuff for a while, at least nothing was inspiring me. And I finally feel like I, I had a leading and I mentioned it last week, but so I'm going to be doing, Ab we're going to do Abraham, Abraham's story. I'm not going to go passage by passage. I'm going to select uh, aspects of Abraham's story. We're going to talk about it. And then I'm going to jump after a few weeks, maybe a couple months, I don't know, and do Revelation and with re in relation to Abraham's story. And I'll explain that in a second. So um, that's going to be uh, what we're going to do. Obviously, I haven't worked out all the details, but it's going to be in a Genesis Abraham start with a Revelation finish. And I don't know what's Ron Trey in the middle, but uh, I will let you know what I'm, what I'm bringing as I bring it. Um, you know, a, a lot of, th there was, I'm not entirely sure exactly why I'm doing this, but I think I'm being led by the Lord. So it's, you know, I, I think there's a, a reason for it, but at least part of it is uh, that Abraham and Revelation is, is, is sort of the Alpha and Omega of the story of Jesus. Uh, it, it has been said, I've said it before, I'll keep saying it. Uh, till my dying day, that you can, you can, in a way, divide the Bible into two parts, uh, two books. One is Genesis 1 through 11, and the other is Genesis 12 to Revelation 22, uh, which is the story of Jesus. The story of Abraham is the story of Jesus Christ, the story of the beginning of the story of salvation. Um, you know, you can work that backwards that, you know, Israel, Abraham, all that was so that when the Son of God came, when Jesus Christ arrived, that we would recognize him that we'd have some sense of what he was about, what he was doing, why he did it, and understand his teachings uh, with relation to the history of Israel, and more importantly, who God is, which ultimately, of course, is what all that comes down to. Who is God, and who are we in relation to God? And so this is the Genesis 12 here is the story of the beginning of Jesus, the beginning of the story of Jesus, I should say. Um, and that's, and hence, I'm going to do sort of the Alpha and Omega of the Jesus story. Abraham, and then uh, jump to Revelation, probably not Revelation 1, probably uh, a little further down the line, but I haven't worked that out yet, so don't hold me to it. Uh, so this, uh, I've never uh, preached actually through uh, Genesis or the story of Abraham, not counting uh, some, uh, some things in Genesis 1 and 2, of course, which are quite germane to our entire story, but uh, so I'm diving into new territory here. And uh, for the first few minutes, it's going to get a little eggheady and culturally and history. Is I, I'm going to, I want to put us in Abraham's world. And uh, I want to say, by uh, way of introduction to this, uh, as we before we dive into these historical and cultural matters, and I won't spend the whole sermon talking about it, but a significant chunk. Just like anything else, when you're preaching through the Bible, uh, you know, for, for those of you assembled here, uh, many of you have a very strong uh, biblical background. Uh, you were raised in the church. You read on your own various theological or historical works. You know the Bible pretty well. Some of you maybe know it less well for various reasons. You know, various levels of education in this regard or history or simply age. Um, but it, it's never the case. Uh, you know, I, I want to say this periodically. I probably say it once every three or four years, probably been three years or so. But, you know, if I talk about you know, a passage in the Greek or some meaning I'm digging out of there, something in the Hebrew, or going into a cultural analysis of uh, Abraham as we're about to do, uh, you know, don't let any pastor or theologian uh, make you think you can't read the Bible on your own. Uh, that's a mistake. Uh, you can sit, anybody can sit down with the Bible at any time, and the Lord, the Holy Spirit can work through those pages and those words and speak to you. Now, there might be things that confuse you in it. I've studied the Bible my, most of my life now, and I, there a significant chunk of the Bible I don't pretend to understand still to this day, I, which I love, by the way, that gives me, <laughs> anyway, I enjoy that. Um, but at any rate, you know, it, it's not the case. You can sit down and read the story of Abraham and the Lord can speak to you through it without any cultural background or historical background, which begs the question then, why do we do it? Well, for one, I think we're, we're told, we're commanded to study the Bible, not just to read it uh, devotionally, although we do, not to read it worshipfully, although we do, but to study it. And when you study it, uh, certain things come in, become clear that weren't clear before. Certain meanings come out, certain things. It's, I find it to be an enjoyable and worshipful experience 
to take what we have learned as human beings about the world and look at the Bible and take these two and mesh them together to try and get closer to truth with a capital T. I think that's fun. And it's also how God has made us. That's why we're told to study the Bible. I've made this analogy before. So forgive me if you've been in the church for a few years, but I, I think of it as the Lord of the Rings, as I think about most things that anybody here can sit down and watch the Lord of the Rings, uh, the movies and enjoy them, understand them. They're fantastic. I encourage you to watch them. I'm a bit of a fan, uh, but as some of you may know, as Laura and I know from our time in Vancouver, uh, the Lord of the Rings behind the scenes narrative is longer than the movie itself, all three movies. So I remember it's like nine or 10 hours long, something like that. We watched all of it, all the, all of the making of and behind the scenes of the Lord of the Rings. And we didn't have to do that to enjoy the movie, right? But it deepened our understanding, you know, why they cut certain scenes, why certain actors said things when they did, how certain special effects were created. All, you know, it, when I watch the movie, I have a lot more understanding of what's going on. Well, this is why we do, this is the behind the scenes of the Bible as best as we know it anyway, uh, as we can understand. It. And I think it deepens our understanding. Taking a good third of the sermon time explaining why I'm giving the sermon. Um, so, but uh, you know, I, uh, it is who I am. So that's, that's what it is. So, okay. So we're going to try and dive into Abraham's world and see if we can get some behind the scenes stuff with Abraham and uh, enter into uh, what it was like uh, to be Abraham at that time. So first of all, just a little geography. I did, I put a little bookmark in, oh, somebody took it out. Well, there was a bookmark in Abraham's, there's a geography book on the back of that couch there has this lovely layout of Abraham's thing. And well, anyway, you can find it again in there. <laughs> um, so uh, this is, a, um, you can see here Ur, which is where uh, Abraham and his family uh, leave from initially. And we'll get to the passage here in a second. This is the, this is in modern day Iraq. Uh, over here's Israel, that way is Iran, Syria is up there, Saudi Arabia down here. Uh, so you can see it's a coastal town. Um, although if you look at a, a map online, just Google Ur today and look at a map, you'll probably see something more like this, where you see Ur is actually about 120 miles or so from the coast. Well, that's not a mistake. Ur was on the coast and uh, the Persian Gulf has uh, dropped uh, several meters. I don't remember how many meters, but it's dropped enough that 120 miles, and it's a fully landlocked city, but it used to be on the coast. So just interesting factoid uh, to impress your friends with at a dinner party. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, where uh, Abraham's family is from initially. Uh, in Ur, there's this famous uh, ziggurat uh, built roughly around 2050 BC. Uh, and there was, of course, many, many other buildings all around this, but this is the remaining one. This is the, the main temple uh, where they worshiped um, the chief god of their pantheon, who is called Sin. Oh, that's confusing because, of course, that word has nothing to do with our word sin. Uh, god was also referred to as uh, Nana, N A N N A, in. in um, uh, Akkadian, the Semitic language. Um, so Nana or Sin was worshipped there, and also in Haran, another city uh, much farther north, which will become relevant later. So this was uh, part of the Sumerian culture, and Abraham was a part of the Sumerian culture. Uh, and uh, that was his, his background, a very powerful empire, one of the first empires, actually, in the history of empires. This is a cuneiform tablet. Actually, this didn't come out as well as I hoped, but this this is a Sumerian king uh, holding court. Uh, uh, someone's asking a favor of the king. That little, I don't know if you can see it, there's a crescent moon up high and that, that's the moon god, Nana or Sin. That symbolizes the god that Abraham would have been very familiar with. Uh, there was a Sumerian queen by the name of Puabi and uh, who lived around 2600 BC and uh, what made her so significant is that they actually found her, uh, most, gra most graves are robbed by the time we get around to it in 2000 AD or whenever, you know, they're just totally looted. Uh, they found one that was unlooted. This is the only Sumerian major uh, grave that was unlooted and they found tons of things. And, you know, if you want to get a sense of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the culture around that time, you can just Wikipedia, uh, Puabi grave goods, you'll find all kinds of pictures and things. I downloaded a couple. Uh, that was a, a, a crown or headdress of the time. That's, that's gold and um, lapis lazuli and probably other things that I don't know. <laughs> well, this is interesting. This is actually a, a decomposing body. It's a little grim. Sorry about that. But just, again, to get into the culture a little bit at the time, uh, when 
Queen Kwabi passed away, um, one of the things they did is they took all of her attendants and it was uh, a little over 70, I think it was 68 young women, teenagers or 20 somethings and then a few men scattered in. I guess you want mostly women attendants and they killed them and laid them out next to, uh, next to the, the queen. So presumably they would have attendance in the afterlife. This is a common thing that's done. Uh, you know, you find it in other places like China or Egypt or what have you. Um, and so I don't put that up there to be just morbid for morbid sake, but a time and place when life is cheap and power is power is power. Might makes right. And that is true of the entire Near, Near Eastern world. Doesn't matter which empire you're talking about. That was the nature of the world. That was the nature of the gods, uh, which um, we may or may not get into this week. And then a couple of final slides here. This is a Sumerian mosaic, again, from roughly the time period of, of Abraham. Uh, so this is a mosaic that they had in the temple um, and it had two sides. One was a peace side. Actually, this is stratified. I don't know if, how, if you can tell, but these are peasants, uh, hard laborers on the bottom carrying heavy loads. Uh, the middle one um, seems to be like more merchants. Uh, someone's carrying fish, they're leading goats uh, and uh, seems like a little, a lighter load as it were. And then the top one are probably the royalty, uh, the nobles of the time. They're sitting, drinking, whatever it is, probably a Starbucks. And uh, the one on the left there is probably a, a king. They're playing music. And so this is the peace version. This is Sumerians at peace, if you will. That's the, the society ordered as it should be in their view. But just because they don't want you to mess with them, uh, on the other side was war. And this is the war side of the mosaic. Uh, down below, the four-wheeled chariots are trampling people. Some bloody things are happening in the middle, I won't describe, and uh, slave, uh, people are being taken into slavery at the top. The Sumerians, uh, to the best of historians' knowledge yet, had the earliest organized army, the very first army that was trained and fought as a unit. Uh, I guess before then, if you were having a war, you, you know, all of us here at Cornerstone would just grab our spears and axes and go running and screaming at the people we're mad at. That's a war, right? Uh, so the Sumerians had the idea what if we took, you know, our strongest, you know, like me and Dan and Doug or whoever, <laughs> okay, thanks for laughing, and, uh, you know, trained us for, you know, made us professional soldiers. That was a new idea. In fact, when we go back into the time of Abraham, we're really going back to a time of almost prehistory. I mean, the very earliest, uh, to the, 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 the earliest aspects of human history, uh, he lives right in the, um, what we call the, you know, the cradle of civilization, the birthplace of civilization, where things like writing and farming and some of the earliest cities uh, took root. So to study Abraham is to study in a way uh, our, our deepest roots as, as, as human beings. Uh, okay. All right. So that's a bit about Abraham's background culture of the, um, and it's not entirely clear. Well, I'll get that in a minute. Okay. Uh, so this is Genesis up until the um, story of Abraham. So you have Genesis 1 to 4 is creation, the fall, the expulsion from the garden, Cain and Abel. Uh, Genesis 5 has a long genealogy. Then Noah, another genealogy, uh, Tower of Babel, and then Abraham's, Abraham's genealogy. And then Genesis 12 starts with Abraham and Sarah's story. Uh, so that's what I mean about Genesis 1 through 11 being, and I made it more explicit here in the next slide, so one way you can construe this, just out of my own uh, fevered imagination, um, Genesis 1 through 4 could be called the problem, <laughs> the problem, the problem of our sin, of our darkness, of, of uh, the world. Genesis 5, long genealogy, uh, which if nothing else puts a little mark on or a check and says this is not mythology, this is history, that these are people and we can trace them back. Uh, which is often the significance of genealogies in the Bible, a whole nother sermon there. Uh, Genesis 6 through 9 is Noah, the flood, which says that the solution to the problem is not going to be God saying, that's it. That, that's the message there. Genesis 10, another long genealogy. Genesis 11, the Tower of ba Babel, which says the solution is not going to be us. Uh, you know, the Tower of Babel that we gathered together with one language to build. Our best idea was to build a really big tower. That's what we came up with. 
here's what we're going to do. It's just going to be really tall. That's that's the the, the story of the Tower of Babel and, and uh, what's the name of that pl the plain of not Siloam, Shinar, Shinar, right? The plain of Shinar. Um, and God says, no, that's not a great idea. Um, you, it, it'll be, I'm sure it'll be impressive. In fact, God says it'll be impressive in essence. He says, they'll do whatever they set their mind to, which is true. I mean, we can do whatever we set our mind to. We can put a man on the moon. When we cooperate and we use our brains, there's, humans can really do amazing things. It just doesn't solve the problem. <laughs> it's, not, it's much easier to put a man on the moon than to deal with your sin. Uh, much easier. Uh, so, um, all apologies to Elon Musk. Um, and then we get to Genesis 12, which is God will bring salvation through Jesus Christ, which of course nobody knows at the point of Genesis 12, but that's, that's the message we know when we start reading. Uh, you know, it's, it's like this huge, it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a solar system sized view of the world up until Genesis 12. They're talking about all of humanity, all of God dealing with us as a, as a people, and then in Genesis 12, it comes down to one man in one place at one time in this, in this you know, Iraqi city uh, of, or Sumerian city of, of Earth. And then that's where salvation begins. Okay, so let's get into the text itself. Um, so it actually starts in Genesis 11, technically, because it talks about Abraham's father. Uh, this is the account of Terah's family line, Terah being Abraham's father. Don't worry about memorizing this. I'll just point out a couple of things. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Chaldeans is, is, is a, uh, anachronistic, well, it doesn't matter. There were no Chaldeans in the land at that time. That's just how they identified it later in the text, if that makes sense. Um, like, like we might talk about the land of, of, well, it doesn't matter, but I think you get it. Okay. Uh, Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. And Sarai was childless. Take note, that becomes important later, because she was not able to conceive. Bit of a hard one to follow, so uh, I downloaded this helpfully from the internet. Uh, Tara at the top. And you can see, uh, so the dotted line means a marriage. So uh, Nahor married his niece, Milka, not something we'd necessarily approve of today, but almost everything that happened back then are not necessarily things we'd approve of today. So that's, that's, that's okay, that's what it is. Uh, you'll see a question mark there coming from Tara, uh, Sarai, um, Abram. There's, it's often believed or assumed or thought that uh, Sarah is Abram's half-sister from a text uh, later on, but um, I'm gonna say no to that. I don't think Sarah is actually Abraham's half-sister. I think that's a mistake and stay tuned because that's gonna get really important later on. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the family and that's where they go. You can see Lot, of course, is Abraham's uh, nephew. Um, and so Abraham's a generation removed from Lot and that explains sometimes his protectiveness of, of Lot later on in the narrative. He feels an obligation to protect him. Okay, so that's, the, that's all the prehistory. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram. Together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. And then that, that sets the stage. And then we get to this, one of the most famous passages in the Bible, Genesis 12, one to three. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And everyone on earth is going to be blessed through you. Now, this is, I, I know this is a very familiar scripture. I know you've heard this a thousand times. So uh, I, I want you to work with me to make this strange again, to make this weird again. We, sometimes, sometimes understanding the Bible is letting it be weird again, because it's a very weird book. It's not normal. It's not what you expect. 
not just from our perspective, but from the time period that Abraham was living in, this is a weird scripture. So it starts off somewhat normative anyway. Um, I will make you into a great nation. That sounds like sort of typical, uh, you know, the sort of thing that someone, uh, you know, that a priest or a prophet might say to a king or a queen at that time. And I will bless you. But I will make you into a great nation is usually followed by something like, and I will let you or, or cause you to conquer all the other nations. You know, I, people will fear you. People will worship you as a god. In fact, that's almost always what happened. Once a king took over enough nations, took over enough places, he or she would almost always end up calling themselves a god. Look at me. I've done all this. I'm actually a, a son or daughter of a god. I'm holy. I'm divine. We're familiar with it in Egypt, but it was common throughout the, the kingdoms, uh, Sumer, Akkadia, whatever. That's a more common thing to say. People will fear you and worship you. You'll be victorious in every battle. Uh, people will be drawn to your power. Uh, you'll be unstoppable until you have conquered all the earth. These are common, these are things you would read. Archaeologists dig up stuff like this all the time and on, the, on the rocks and things that people carved in back then, the steel and whatnot. This God wants to bless the whole world. That's his stated purpose. Through you, I will bless the whole earth. That is not normal. That's, that's atypical. God wants to bless the whole world, and he has chosen Abraham as his instrument to accomplish this, or at least his initial instrument. He doesn't want to conquer or destroy. He wants to bless. How badly the land does need blessing at that time and indeed today. And yet, think about this. Any blessing that God would bring through Abraham would be fleeting, right? Why? Well, because it's very Ecclesiastes, very Solomon. Our lives are fleeting. So we're only here. We're like a vapor. We're, you know, all we are is dust in the wind. Yes? Right. Amen. That's right. We're here for just for a second, just for a minute in God's eyes. Sometimes I feel like in my eyes, too. <laughs> no one told me how quickly time started to pass once you got past the 40. But like downhill. Where am I? So any blessing would be fleeting. So how, how would, that, thank you. I appreciate that. I do think I look good. You're welcome to come every Sunday That's, and say that. <laughs> so consider too in this moment. So not only do we know how the blessing would look, think about how little, this is what always surprises me when I reflect on this, I, you know, and I don't reflect on it all the time, but when I do reflect on it, it hits me. How little Abraham knows about God. How little he knows about any of it. This, this is before Moses. This is before the law was given. This is before the Ten Commandments. This is before uh, the prophets. This is before the, the Israel, of course. So he knows next to nothing about God. I mean, that, that, that's astounding to me when you think about the depth of Abraham's faith. How does Abraham even know who God is? Like, we don't even know the nature of their communication. Is God giving Abraham dreams? Is he sending an angel to speak to him? Is he, is he just talking in his heart in some kind of revelatory way? I mean, one of the really frustrating things about the Old Testament in general is just what it doesn't tell you, which is almost everything. <laughs> You're on a need-to-know basis in the Old Testament, and apparently God thinks you don't need to know much uh, because there's so much that's unknown. All we know is that God has spoken to Abraham, that Abraham knows very little about God, but he has come to trust God in, in some way, in, in a sufficient way, such that he's, he's willing to, to die or live, not just to live for, but to die for God too. So, to follow this God is not like following other gods. For one thing, if you look at the initial command, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Right there, he made Abraham a, a stranger in a strange land, a resident alien. He made him not comfortable, right? Around people he did not know, languages he did not speak, cultures he was less familiar with. And certainly, and above all, and this is the part I think that we tend to miss living in the world as we do, his putting his life in danger. You know, if you're a Sumerian or you're an Akkadian, if you're, if you're, if you're part of an empire, you want to stay in that empire. That's where the army is. That's who protects you. You know, there's no United Nations or 
there's, you know, this, that's your protection is your people. To go from your people is not like us going to visit France where you're gonna find a nice baguette. You know, it's, it's, to, it's to go to a country where the French might decide to kill you or to do something terrible to your, your spouse. I mean, and there's nothing you could do about it. I mean, remember that those attendants who were murdered, I mean, there, there's nothing you can do about it. So it's, it's not a light thing to suddenly become a stranger in a strange land at this time period. It's not a light thing at any time, but particularly in this time, it's a very dangerous thing. And that's what God asks of him. But he doesn't ask him to go entirely alone. And I'm going to take a little ray of hope from this. He often, oftentimes, as a Christian, I do sometimes feel like an alien in my hometown. Sometimes I feel, you know, like when you give your life to Christ, it does sometimes feel like being a stranger in a strange land. Um, not to that degree as Abraham, but it does feel that way. But he's never asked me and he never asked Abraham to go it alone entirely. You know, he had his wife. He had his, his, his people, the group that he was with. He took his, um, uh, his servants. He had slaves and he also had uh, freedmen servants, as it were, and their families. And he took all of them with him. He had a, a community of sorts. Um, I have my community too, and we have our community. We are here together. We do not go alone, and God doesn't usually, I want to say God never, but God doesn't usually ask us to be alone like that. He gives us brothers and sisters and a family. But there's something else about this blessing. It makes Abraham into a co-worker of what the Lord is doing. And this is something else weird about this. We're used to it. Again, I know we're used to it. But this is a weird thing to turn a human being into a co-worker of what you, as a God, especially if you're the only God in existence, that's a strange thing too. Usually that's not how it's done. This, this, has been an, this is an unusual thing about our faith from the beginning. Abraham's life becomes tied to the Lord. And God says, I will take your side in all things. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, that curse will bounce back onto them. And notice it's not even tied to Abraham's righteousness. It's just, it's almost like a law of nature that he gives to Abraham. It's like, you're just, you're going to be blessed. Because by the way, Abraham is not always righteous. And we'll get to that in due course. But, you know, he says, my, you know, your way will be my way. My way will be your way. We're tied together so that the earth will be blessed. This is one of the ways we know that Jesus is God's son, because this continues on. John 15, greater love has no one than this. This is Jesus speaking. Lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I feel like this is kind of what God is saying to Abraham, that part in red in particular. I have called you my friend. I bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. Everything I learned from my father, I've made known to you. Well, he's letting Abraham know what he needs to know, but he is letting Abraham in on what's going on. You did not choose me. Abraham didn't wake up one morning and think, you know, I'm going to follow this new God or whatever. No. I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. And this is my command to love each other. And this has been, so this has been true from Abraham on through Jesus that, that, that God looks at you and says, you're going to be my coworker. You're, we're going to partner together. I'm going to bless you. And we're going to, we're going to do this together. You're going to build the kingdom with me. Now, blessing doesn't always look, <laughs> how much time do I have? <laughs> okay, I'll take a couple minutes here. Blessing does not always look like the kind of blessing Abraham. Abraham had very material, materially rich blessings, right? He had animals, he had servants, he had, uh, he had an army. I mean, he was, he was a blessed man and the Lord continued to bless him materially. That might be true for you. Uh, that, and that's, you know, every good thing comes from the hand of the Lord, right? So that's okay. 
Sometimes God's blessing is more of an Elijah or John the Baptist kind of blessing, which is that he takes and says, you will not be rich. You will be poor in the land. You will suffer. And if you hand it to me, if you give it to me, I will make you a servant and we will co-work together. So, you know, I, the reason I say this so strenuously is because I heard a sermon on my vacation <laughs> uh, that I, I actually agreed with every single thing the pastor said, and I thought carefully about it. Um, this was in Colorado, and I, I liked his sermon. I thought it was a good sermon. I just thought it was half of a good sermon. I was like, well, because he talked about this. He talked about how every good thing comes from God's hand and, and the blessing of the, that God can give you in terms of your wealth and your goods, and how if you get those blessings, you should turn around and bless others. And I mean, it was, there wasn't a thing in that sermon I thought was wrong, but I thought, but that's not always the way God's blessing works. In fact, we're supposed to be a little leery of material. We should be a little anxious about material blessing in the sense that it can make it can easily become an idol. Uh, you know, when Jesus talks about poverty and wealth in the Bible, which one is dangerous? <laughs> As, you all know, right? Wealth is dangerous. As an American, I feel that. I, you know, we have so much stuff, and I understand the danger of it. You know, so it, it's uh, where was I going with that? But it, yeah, so there, you know, there's. Blessing does not always look like the Abrahamic blessing, but it can. And, and that's, that's the way, that's, was that? That's right, you shouldn't be worried about materialistic things, yeah. And I've been guilty of that maybe from time to time. Probably most of us have at some point or other. But you're right, yeah, we should not. Set our eyes on the things of the Lord. So I, I called this sermon, I'll, I'll wrap this up here. Um, I. I I put on the on the order of service, I called it the new hope. I, I hope you all get that reference. Thank you. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, and uh, but and a little tongue in cheek, but I do think there's uh, there's a truth that this is this is the new hope that God offers and continues to offer us. And we're all descendants of Abraham, spiritually speaking, some of us, maybe even physically speaking, but we're all definitely descendants of Abraham, spiritually speaking. And this is when this is the moment when it started at a time and place that was beyond our imagining in terms of just its level of violence and, and coldness. And that should, that should bring hope to us. Amen. We're gonna have our time of communion now. Um, I'm gonna say a prayer and then I'll read the scripture from Luke and then I'll invite you to come join us. Lord, in whatever form it might look, in whatever way, whatever path it might take, uh, we do ask for your blessing on us as a church, your blessing on us as individuals. And Lord, we accept everything from your hand. Um, even as I was talking about earlier with Niels, Lord, we accept life and we accept death. We accept abundance we accept poverty, as long as in all these things we may be found in you. Lord, we know that Abraham was blessed, but he was also willing to sacrifice that which meant most to him for you. May we be like-minded. Lord, as we go to the table and remember your sacrifice, may we be like-minded as you, Jesus willing to pour out our lives for others, even as you poured out yours for us. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As you are led, you can come and share in the elements. 